what's going on there? What did you learn that you didn't expect going in? That there are pockets that are a lot better than what we think they are. That certainly every soldier from the guy that hung out of the helicopter that was the specialist all the way up to the three-star general said the same thing. That look, we know bad things happen, but it's getting better. I've been here once, I've been here twice. Things are better than when I first got here. And that we're doing our jobs and we're accomplishing things. Do you think the U.S. should keep troops in Iraq for the foreseeable future? I think they need to keep troops in Iraq until the security is there. And I suspect that there will be troops there over the long period because if you think about the countries where we've been successful in our history, we still have troops there. And the book Indivisible is available in stores now? In stores now and on all the regular internet places. Is and there another book that. in the works? Actually, it, yes there is and just because you get these great ideas about books. So I'm working on something else that I hope will come up out in spring of 2007. Martha Zoller, thanks very much. Thank you. Russian President Vladimir Putin will host the G8 summit next weekend in St. Petersburg. Andrei Pointkovsky writes about the former KGB agent's domestic and foreign policy since 2001 in his new book, Another Look into Putin's Soul. He spoke about it at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C., where he is a visiting fellow. This is an hour and 40 minutes. Okay, let's begin, please. Uh, one administrative note, please silence any communication devices that you might have. Uh, I want to welcome the panelists and the audience. For, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend this presentation. I want to also especially welcome the C-SPAN audience and other viewers on television. Uh, Andrei Plankowski will speak first, and I will introduce the other panelists as they make their presentations. Andre is currently a senior visiting fellow at Hudson. From 1994 to 2005, he serves as director of the Center for Strategic Research, a Moscow-based think tank. He has written several books and many articles for publication. Andre has a new book entitled On Another Look into Putin's Soul, and we have signed copies available for sale outside. And Andre will also stay afterwards to discuss his presentation as well as meet with media. Uh, just as a reminder, the G8 summit in St. Petersburg will begin in less than two weeks. The perhaps the most important relationship among the G8 leaders is that between President George Bush and Vladimir Putin. When they first met in Slovenia in 2001, Bush famously said, I was able to get a sense of his soul, a man deeply committed to his country and the best interests of his country. Since then, Russia has taken a number of actions that have evoked criticism by administration officials. Those include curbing press freedom, changing the electoral procedures in ways that have harmed the opposition parties, and a new law that appears to weaken the role of NGOs operating in Russia. Yet the two countries still cooperate heavily on counterterrorism, regional security issues, and they just recently, a few days ago, renewed the Copter Threat Reduction Program. Certain key questions naturally arise for Andre and the other panelists. Did Bush misread Putin's soul at the time? Has Putin's soul changed since their first meeting? Andre, Putin's soul, does he have one? <laughs> Every human being has a soul. Uh, thank you, Richard. And, um, you know that Richard is a very tough administrator, and he warned all of us that we have very limited uh, space uh, of time. So I hope very much on active questioning uh, to have additional time. But uh, nevertheless, first of all, I, I spent uh, at least 30 second, seconds of my time uh, to express my mm, uh, gratitude uh, uh, to Hudson uh, Institute colleague administration, first of all to Ken Weinstein, to our wonderful PR Vice President Grace Stasian, and to my old friend uh, David Setter for enormous help, uh, without which uh, this event uh, would not happen. This book is a kind of uh, uh, political diary. Uh, it contains uh, my text, article, essays uh, from uh, 1999, uh, until the latest uh, entry is uh, 
uh, dated uh, this June about political development uh, uh, in Russia. And uh, you find that uh, I defined uh, my, let's put it mildly, rather skeptical attitude uh, uh, to then candidate to the president and uh, acting president and president Putin uh, from, the very, uh, from the very beginning. And I think that events uh, validated this, my assessment. Uh, I disagree with two widespread uh, perception uh, about uh, Putin in comparison with uh, his predecessor. One apologet apologetic and one denouncing. The apologetic uh, um, view uh, widely presented now by government official propaganda that Putin uh, have been fighting with oligarch system, with anarchy of uh, Yeltsin pe uh, period, he restore as a sovereignty of state, restore order um, uh, in the country. Uh, well, uh, it's very strange uh, theory because uh, what's, uh, may I remind you that Putin was appointed uh, to be uh, president of the country by the same people uh, whom he is supposed to fight. Uh, the, um, one of the most repulsive uh, figures of this Yeltsin oligarchy people, Boris uh, Berezovsky, actually uh, was the driving force of uh, all this uh, operation uh, uh, successor. Uh, Yeltsin Kwan um, was threatened then by uh, almost imminent uh, coming uh, to the power representative or other uh, business political client of Russia, Rushkov and Primakov, uh, uh, which threatened them with a lot of uh, um, unpleasant thing. And uh, um, they uh, the, the task uh, before them was uh, uh, formidable, almost mi mission impossible, uh, to make an absolutely unknown figure, uh, not only president of the country, but as a kind of uh, national hero. And uh, I, I write about uh, this in book detail. The main instrument of Putin campaign in 1990 certainly was uh, uh, Chechen uh, war. Uh, a Kremlin collective, Karov, invented uh, a slogan uh, for him uh, to wipe out uh, terrorists uh, in the shit house. And this, this, with this slogan, uh, he uh, waged his, uh, his campaign um, and became, uh, became a president. And now we see the consequences. Uh, 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 what happened, it's not uh, elimination of system of uh, uh, criminal capitalism in Russia, it's just uh, elimination of some figures of Yeltsin uh, period uh, uh, and substituting them with new cronies. A new oligarchs uh, of uh, Putin, uh, Czechist uh, entourage. Uh, I, it was uh, this uh, direction of event uh, was clear to me enough when, for example, uh, I wrote uh, an article on January 20th, 2000, uh, Putinism uh, during Putin the first election campaign. Putinism as the highest and final stage of uh, criminal uh, capitalism uh, in Russia. No, no liberal paper, uh, by the way, published uh, uh, this essay, because I should add that uh, part of liberal intelligence in Russia uh, bears enormous uh, responsibility uh, for uh, the, um, Putin coming to power and establishing called this regime. They have been dreaming for a long time about Russian Pinochet, uh, who would uh, uh, pay, uh, who would lead Russia on the way of uh, economic reform by, uh, by, by iron hand. Well, they got a president with uh, um, natural of a person of his background disregard uh, for democratic institution, uh, but no real liberal reform and uh, modernization. If uh, in first term of, uh, uh, of his president, some liberal minister managed uh, to introduce some reasonable uh, measures, uh, I think Anders uh, will talk about it uh, in more details, like uh, uh, flat tax, for example. Now it's, uh, it's uh, 
uh, absolutely clear that modernization proved to be a banal, straightforward redistribution uh, of uh, wealth uh, in, uh, uh, in the favor um, of new, uh, new persons uh, of power. And this, uh, the essence of oligarchic systems, this incestuous uh, merge, uh, union of money and, uh, and power, of business and power, uh, well, uh, states uh, and uh, mm, this block uh, Russian uh, Russian uh, Russian breakthrough into into post-industrial uh, society. Uh, to the, our today meeting is uh, um, on the eve of uh, G8 uh, summit, and I would like to maybe initiate our discussion making some remark uh, about uh, Russian foreign policy under Putin. Uh, well, my main, uh, my main uh, message is that Putin is not, uh, Putin is just logical continuation of Yeltsin regime, both uh, in, uh, in, uh, in all its negative characteristics of that regime. The, the people who, uh, uh, another, another misconception, the people, uh, many people um, denounce Putin as uh, a person who, uh, well, strangulate, uh, a flourishing democracy in Russia. It's not the case. Uh, the first uh, uh, exercises of so-called managed democracy were Yeltsin election in uh, in '96, and as I already mentioned, uh, the Putin accession of power is also was uh, anything but a triumph of of democracy. The same. Um, I see the same continuation in foreign policy also, not only uh, Yeltsin period, but, well, I would say the latest several hundreds of Russian history, because uh, uh, Russian relationship with the West uh, for the latest several hundred years is cyclic uh, period of uh, um, approachment and disengagement, of uh, attraction uh, and repulsion. We saw uh, two such periods uh, during Yeltsin, period, uh, Yeltsin term uh, under Foreign Minister Kozarev and Foreign Minister Primakov. And under Putin term, we saw the same uh, cyclic, uh, uh, cyclic um, change. The Putin, uh, we remember Putin who uh, on September 11th uh, said Americans, uh, we, are, we are with you. And this statement uh, uh, was supported uh, uh, by, uh, I think, his very wise policy in, uh, in Afghan uh, conflict. I have nothing personal about uh, uh, this guy. In 2001-2003, I uh, actively supported uh, uh, his uh, foreign policy because uh, his po foreign policy answered the national interest uh, uh, of the Russia. Um, supporting Americans, uh, uh, he led them uh, to solve uh, very serious uh, security uh, Russian problem, like to liquidate uh, the stronghold of Islamic uh, uh, Islamic um, uh, extremist radicals uh, uh, on south border, southern border of Russia. Maybe for the first time in Russian military history, uh, somebody did uh, uh, for us uh, a dirty job. It's American did it's not uh, of charity for Russia. It was just clear case of uh, coincidence uh, of uh, of uh, our security and strategic uh, interest. I think uh, uh, nothing has changed with this fundamental fact. Uh, I, I think that we face uh, basically the same challenge and we need each other, uh, maybe more than, uh, um, than um, any time before. But today's Putin attitude is quite different. Uh, uh, he's uh, mm, doing his best uh, to push out American, uh, American bases from Central Asia. For what purpose? Well, uh, uh, what uh, NATO, NATO is trying uh, uh, to hold uh, uh, in Afghanistan against uh, resurgence of, of Taliban. If uh, the coalition uh, in Afghanistan suffers uh, defeat and the situation uh, is very shaky and fragile, 
we returned to the situation uh, on uh, 2001 with the same threat of Taliban. When, by the way, before September 11, we, uh, our general staff planned uh, uh, military operation in the Central Asia, bombardment of Taliban. Uh, well, fortunately, this uh, problem was solved for us um, by Americans. Uh, well, I have very few time, but I just uh, several points. Why this change? Why, and why this change in gen general? Uh, well, should we be just philosophical about this shift in Russian foreign policy and in Russian relationship uh, with the West? Because, 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 as I already mentioned, well, uh, historian counting 25 or 26 such cycle of rapprochement and disengagement. I think it's dangerous because never before uh, West and Russia as a part of the West, because uh, um, face such serious uh, civilizational challenges and uh, uh, threats to its security. In 19th and in 20th centuries, uh, West and Russia were the dominant, uh, so dominant forces uh, on the world arena. Now uh, they are more vulnerable and uh, more weak than ever before and uh, they need each other to can't afford this split up. And another reason that, unfortunately, uh, the combination of factors which provoke this uh, new coolment in Russian, uh, Russian uh, Western relations have a tendency uh, have a tendency to continue for foreseeable future. Uh, first of all, certainly, it's a deep psychological complex uh, uh, suffered uh, uh, by Russian political elite at a, as a result uh, of defeat in the Cold War, uh, loss of empire, of status of superpower. It provokes a serious underlying animosity to the West. And by the way, this decision of Putin in September 11 was taken against uh, against uh, uh, the resistance, uh, implicit or sometimes explicit, of majority of Russian political class and uh, his uh, entourage. The second reason is that, as I already mentioned, uh, the second term, uh, Putin's second term, make very clear, uh, very clear the character. Uh, of internal economic uh, and uh, political regime. And uh, this regime needs uh, now image of West as an enemy, as maybe a sole justification of uh, authoritarian system. Because the popular uh, justification of uh, uh, some uh, um, level of authoritarianism in the Russian political system during the first re term of Putin was, well, it's necessary for modernization of uh, economy, we should uh, well implement uh, liberal reform and, uh, and so on. Now, well, nobody believes this thing, and uh, that's why propaganda um, extremely actively intoxicates public opinion with the idea of, uh, of uh, America as an enemy, and Putin himself contributed to this a lot. Uh, first of all, by his uh, fantastic statement uh, uh, after Biswan that uh, Islamic terrorists, uh, they just a tool in the, in the uh, hands of uh, more dangerous, more powerful, and more uh, traditional uh, enemies of Russia. And the third reason, I reason is that uh, um, uh, Russian political leadership and political class uh, generally is intoxicated now by, a, uh, by uh, exorbitant oil prices, but new sense of assertiveness. If you uh, read Russian uh, world, um, media now on Russia, assertiveness is a key, uh, is a key, uh, is a key, uh, is a key vote. But unfortunately, this new assertiveness uh, is understood and realized in Moscow, not as a as in uh, um, defending, uh, pursuing uh, um, uh, genuine Russian security interests, but as in the case of uh, uh, Central Asia, just in, uh, in uh, indulging in the classical zero-sum game uh, with the uh, with, uh, United States. And the last, uh, but maybe not the least, uh, reason for such development is this a set of mistakes, blunders, failures 
of the West uh, uh, during uh, the latest two or three years created uh, impression among part, even jubilant impression uh, among part of Russian political elites that the West is a sinking ship and it's necessary uh, uh, maybe uh, to abandon this uh, uh, ship as, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, such uh, perception found uh, by the very reflection in some conceptual statements uh, uh, of uh, Russian Foreign Minister uh, Sergei uh, Lavrov. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, Putin said in September 11, Americans, uh, we are with you. What Lavrov is writing in his conceptual uh, article, I would recommend uh, many to read Russian global policy in Moscow News. Americans, we are not with you, we are rather against with you. His famous formula is that uh, Russia can take side in the unleashed uh, um, conflict uh, of, uh, of uh, civilization. It's a new definition uh, of uh, what uh, was perceived in uh, both in Russian-American official documents early as a uh, common struggle against international uh, terrorism. Uh, this uh, uh, overall formula ironically uh, reminds, uh, it's, it's classic a remake on a famous uh, uh, Stalin Foreign Minister Molotov formula in 1939. Uh, that the uh, Soviet Union can't take side in the world war unleashed uh, by uh, Anglo-French uh, imperialists. Uh, this, and uh, this reflected in practical, in many practical action, uh, in placating uh, uh, such gentlemen, such like Maninjan, uh, Marshall, in protecting them uh, uh, in, security, uh, in Security Council. Uh, well, the problem, uh, the problem uh, is that uh, in spite of this attempt uh, to dissociate uh, itself from the West, in the enemies of the West, in this enemies of Islamofascists, Russia is a part of this satanic, uh, uh, satanic uh, West. And moreover, it's uh, the most uh, vulnerable part uh, and uh, um, more attractive for uh, the um, advance and the tragic uh, death of uh, Russian diplomats uh, in several days after the tragic death of uh, American uh, soldiers in, in the Middle East remind us about this, uh, uh, this truth and remind us again how for both United States and uh, uh, for both and, and Russia uh, uh, how important for us is uh, uh, to keep uh, together in this uh, uh, very dangerous um, uh, 20, uh, 21st uh, century. And uh, well, I hope uh, very much uh, that uh, on the coming uh, G8 uh, meeting, uh, uh, Bush may, will make maybe another look in Putin's soul and they try uh, to talk frankly about, uh, about uh, this problem. Because what is going until now, it's pretending. Until recently, uh, American administration pretended that well, everything fine. Uh, well, uh, a couple of months ago, State Secretary Madam Rice stated that uh, American-Russian relationship is as good as they've never been so for the latest uh, 40 years. Well, let me say, as an insider who uh, um, remembers Soviet time, they have never been so bad. Because, uh, because in the Soviet time, uh, well, there were no, uh, the, I think the last uh, 20 years of uh, Soviet-American uh, confrontation uh, was a kind of, uh, was perceived by Russian leadership, and it's kind of condominium uh, of uh, um, managing the world. And the perception was that, well, we, USSR and US, were playing uh, in the Super League. And it was a sense, well, confrontation, but mutual respect. There were no uh, such uh, emotional uh, hostility generated uh, by these complexes uh, about, uh, which uh, uh, I mentioned, uh, by this but this strange mixture uh, of uh, inferiority complex and megalomania complex. Uh, well, I, I, I realize it was very, very short. 
uh, certainly, and uh, certainly somebody asked me, and I'm ready to, uh, to, uh, to tell about American responsibility for this, uh, for this uh, splitting up as a, as a, as a Russian writer and uh, uh, Russian uh, um, active politician. I, I am a member of uh, um, uh, leadership of opposition. Yeah, but I'm more concentrated certainly on, uh, on criticism of, uh, of uh, Moscow and our president. But my main message is that we just can't afford uh, us each other. Thank you very much, Andre. Our next speaker will be Carl Gershman, who is president of the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, this is a private, congressionally supported grant-making institution. Its mission is to strengthen democratic institutions around the world. It also publishes the, the well-known quarterly Journal of Democracy. Carl also took the lead in launching in New Delhi in 1999 the World Movement for Democracy, which is a global network of democracy practitioners and scholars. Prior to assuming his position with the endowment, he was senior counselor to the U.S. representative of the United Nations. Uh, like our other speakers, Carl has an extensive list of publications. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you especially to uh, Andre. Uh, I just got the book over the weekend, um, <clears throat> but had a little time and was able to read it. And uh, I, I think it's terrific, but not so much because he tells us a lot about Putin, um, but because uh, Andre is, is a, a Russian patriot who is able to discuss the whole issue of Russia and its relationship with the world in, in, in a large way. And I think it returns us. It takes us away from the day-to-day -day issues, although they're there, of course, uh, that he's just been discussing, and, and, and brings us back uh, to the fundamentals, uh, the fundamentals of Russia's uh, relationship with the West, uh, the psychological issues that he was just talking about at the end, the megalomania, the inferiority, uh, and, and explains to us why this relationship uh, is so complex. Um, the role of the political technologists, which appears in the book, which are playing such a insidious, uh, insidious role uh, uh, today. Uh, the whole question of Russia's relations with its neighbors, its desire to reestablish the empire, its hopeless desire, as he points out, to reestablish the empire. In particular, the book deals extensively, more extensively than anything else I've read in some time with the whole issue of Chechnya. Chechnya is an issue that is off the table for pretty much everybody. And I think is what Andre makes clear in this book is that Chechnya is not an issue that can be swept off the table. It's not an internal problem. It's not a marginal question. It's a central question which we have to deal with and should be raised within the international arenas, not just with a resolution here and there uh, of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe or some other place, but at the G8. I mean, these things need to be talked about because they're absolutely central and related to the other very fundamental and large question that Andre raises in the book, which is the relationship of Russia uh, and Islam. Um, just very briefly, th th I think that what emerges from the book is, is a certain program of action. Um, I want to refer to two items, and then a third, which is not clear enough in the book, and I want to sort of challenge Andre to speak a little bit more about it. The first I've already said is, is the whole question of, uh, uh, of Chechnya. Uh, at one point in the book, Andre, uh, Andre writes that Putin actually got it right in something that he said about Chechnya. Uh, he said in 2000, he observed, in the final analysis, the formal status of Chechnya is not all that important to us. What is important is that no threat should ever arise to Russia from this territory. And I think, as he makes perfectly clear, the way Russia has dealt with this issue, uh, it has dealt with it precisely uh, so that a threat will emerge from the jihadists to Russia from Russian soil, which is Chechnya. Uh, and not to do, as he speaks about in, uh, in a passage just before that, uh, he says, the only move open to us is to drive a wedge between Chechen separatism and international terrorism. In other words, instead of making Maschadov the enemy and Akhmadov the enemy and murdering the enemies uh, to try to find allies within the Chechen uh, people to try to deal with the status issue in a constructive way and to try to make common cause with them 
against the international jihadists whose aim is to destroy Chechnya just as it is the aim of some Russians. I think it's a very constructive approach which he offers in the book and I think it's something which the United States has to take very, very seriously and cease simply ignoring uh, this fundamental question. The second point uh, which I think uh, he calls for in the, in the book, which I think is much more on the U.S. agenda, is the importance of protecting the new status and independence and integrity of Ukrainian democracy. I would add to that just one more point, that it's also uh, important to protect the new status and integrity and independence of Georgian democracy. Today, uh, uh, Misha Saakashvili will be meeting with President Bush, um, and uh, he is a strong leader. Um, uh, I think he deeply wants and needs U.S. support. I think if these two countries can preserve their status, uh, Russia is going to try to do what it can to try to undermine that status. But if this can be preserved, I think it's the beginning of a new relationship uh, with Russian democracy. It will show models of, uh, of countries that once were part of the Soviet Union, which are achieving successful democracy and integration with the West. Uh, and that should be promoted uh, looking down, looking toward the future when Russia itself will be um, a, a full democracy and integrated with the West, whereas Andre says over and over again in the book, uh, which is where it rightly belongs. And finally, the point which I don't think Andre deals with sufficiently in the book, and I want to challenge him to deal with more, is the whole issue of civil society and the, um, uh, and the struggle that's taking place in Russia today uh, to destroy the independence of the NGOs. Uh, it's been mentioned that on the 15th of July, the G8 summit will open. Uh, next Tuesday, July 11th, there will be a meeting in Russia called the Other Russia uh, of NGO leaders and uh, political opposition leaders. Just today, uh, July 5th, uh, independent human rights organizations met and issued an appeal uh, to uh, the G8 leaders uh, to uh, deal with all of the issues of, of uh, the, the kinds of issues and problems that uh, Andre is talking about in the book, including, uh, including Chechnya. Uh, I think their voice needs to be listened to. Uh, everyone knows about the new uh, NGO law, which Russia uh, approved in, in January. I think the, the civil society people feel that the full impact of this law will be felt after the summit, starting July 18th, uh, when the pressure of the summit is lifted. Signals have to be sent, I think, during the, uh, during the summit uh, that uh, this issue uh, is going to be watched very, very closely. Uh, Andre uh, ha has written in a paper which he prepared for this meeting, uh, but which he didn't note. Uh, he made a point which I agree with, where he said democracy in Russia is primarily a matter for Russians. I agree with that completely. But Russians and Russian independent organizations and Democrats need support from the West, and they deserve support from the West, and that support is proper. And we should not permit the Russian government, Putin, his political technologists, to delegitimize that support by saying that somehow um, uh, that this is uh, interference in the internal affairs of Russia. Putin just said to the press that the Council of Europe reviewed the NGO law and approved the NGO law. They never did. Uh, they found many problems with this law. Um, and I think that uh, we should use the fact, among other things, that the, the, the ruble has just been made convertible, that obviously Russia is interested in economic growth and, and economic integration with the international uh, economy. Uh, we should use the leverage that, that derives from that, as well as our political influence, to try to protect civil society. Uh, all the other in sectors of, uh, of Russian life, the media, uh, the judiciary, the, the, re the provincial governments, the political party system, and so forth, the integrity and the independence of these sectors has pretty much been ended. Uh, civil society is the last remaining stronghold of independent activity, and I think it's critical that we work together with the uh, Democrats in Russia to preserve that and to build upon that for the future. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Andre will respond to all the panelists at the end. The next speaker is Andres Ausland, uh, who is an expert in post-communist economic transformation he is currently a senior fellow at the Institute for International Economics. From 1994 to 2005,
He worked at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Both of these are Washington, D.C. based think tanks. And at one point at Carnegie, he ran their Russian and Eurasia program. Uh, Anders has also served as the senior economic advisor to the governments of Russia, Ukraine, and Kyrgyzstan. And, of course, and he has many publications to his credit. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Andre on an uh, excellent book. This is a very good read. So read it fast through, and you feel that you have a good sense of what the situation is in Russia today. And uh, I think that it's thoughtful, sharp, uh, uh, insightful. Uh, I think there is one sentence in the book that sort of captures most of it. Over the last 100 years, Russian history has gone full circle, and we are back where we started. And frankly, I don't think that's too bad. It's much better than the Soviet system. And after all, the Tsarist system didn't last uh, so uh, long, uh, if we uh, go back 100 years or so. So this is a system that uh, could develop. So I see a certain hope in uh, that se uh, sentence. And another fundamental insight in the book is that this is pretty much a criminal uh, economic organization that uh, is running uh, 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 the state. And uh, if we look upon the six Putin years, today there can be no doubt, and I congratulate Andre on having been very clear on it early on, that uh, the main Putin project was to build authoritarianism in Russia. And he has been very systematic and very successful in this ta uh, task. Indeed, Freedom House uh, ranks its success here uh, uh, quite extraordinary. Russia is the only country that has managed to move from partially free to unfree in the last uh, six years. So this has been systematic. The other task where Putin has been very successful so far has been economic growth. Russia has had an average growth of 6.7 percent, properly measured. There is no problem with the measurement here. Uh, during the last seven years. There are other countries that have done even better, but this is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, outstanding. And uh, the danger today is that you put these two observations together and say that it's better with authoritarianism for economic growth. We have a danger of the new authoritarian myth that I think is very important uh, to, uh, to fight. And I would argue that there are essentially two reasons for this uh, splendid economic uh, growth that we have seen. One is a critical mass of uh, liberalization, stabilization, and pri uh, privatization that came into fruition, ironically, with the Russian financial crash of 98. That sort of cleared out the system. In hindsight, we can say that this was the catharsis that uh, Russian capitalism uh, uh, needed. And we can particularly see this is in the oil industry and the uh, metallurgy that have revived splendidly, or for that matter, in the previously so hopeless coal industry. And all these have revived splendidly under private ownership. Putin didn't play a role there. He was just uh, uh, a beneficiary of uh, uh, prior developments. And the other point, uh, of course, of course, high oil prices. Currently, the Russian economic growth is driven by the consumer sectors, retail trade and uh, uh, housing construction, which is good, but uh, it's thanks to a massive uh, uh, oil surplus. Uh, during Putin's three years, he did undertake a lot of economic reforms. So if you look up on the economic side of Putin, uh, which Andre does not discuss that much uh, uh, in his book. Uh, the turning point is uh, 2003. And uh, I would, of course, emphasize uh, the arrest of uh, uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the chairman of Yukos, on the 25th of October 2003. Because of that very event, Putin had to abandon his tax reform because he had decided to tax Yukos to death which he successfully did. And uh, the other was that he needed to do, do away with a judicial reform, which he equally successfully did. So what we are seeing here is a quiet person who doesn't say what he's intent on doing, and he does it very uh, uh, systematically. 
and we can only judge afterwards what he has actually done. Do you remember all these things that Putin said about uh, democracy? Andrei sensibly never uh, believed them, but there are lots of such uh, statements. And uh, 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 we can only see afterwards that this was uh, not on. So what uh, is the essence of this uh, regime today? I would completely agree with uh, Andrei. It's a seizure of assets. What has happened in the last year is that 5% of Russia's GDP has been renationalized. This is one of the biggest uh, renationalizations uh, uh, that we have seen in uh, post socialist uh, times. And at the same time, we are seeing a reinforcement of the authoritarianism. And the third feature that is becoming more clearly that uh, Andre discusses very well in the last third of his book. It is that the authoritarianism is influencing the foreign policy of Russia in a negative uh, uh, fashion. And by the way, what about corruption? Corruption has been increasing after 2004 in Russia. Before that, it was declining, according to Transparency uh, International. And now, in the last measurement, for the first time, Transparency International shows that Russia is more corrupt than Ukraine. And uh, here you see the effect of democracy and transparency and wonderful scandals in the media. They do influence uh, corruption so that uh, it's uh, being reduced. And what about the U.S. role in this um, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, state of affairs? Richard uh, cited the President Bush's most famous uh, statement about President Putin at the first meeting. But I would like to turn to uh, his uh, statement at Camp David uh, on the 27th of September 2003, three months after the Yukos uh, affair had started. And I quote, this is in the prepared statement by the President. I respect President Putin's vision for Russia, a country at peace within its borders, with its neighbors, and with the world a country in which democracy and freedom and rule of law thrive." End of quote. And uh, four weeks afterwards, uh, President Putin arrested Khodorkovsky, obviously having understood that uh, President Bush would in no way protest against such an event. So we can't say that the US didn't have an opportunity to influence. We can clearly say that the U.S. did not influence events in any uh, positive way. So what uh, should the uh, U.S. president do in this uh, uh, situation? Well, the, the first and most obvious thing is that he should not praise him for what he's not doing, and uh, that the words should at least be truthful. And turning now to the G8 summit in St. Petersburg, I would argue that the three most important U.S. interests with regard to Russia concern democracy in uh, the whole region, the sovereign, secondly, the sovereignty of the other former uh, republics, and thirdly, energy security. And on the first two points, the important thing is to make public statements that are clear enough. I think the worst that could happen to President Bush is if uh, uh, President Putin afterwards annexes Abkhazia, which he has threatened publicly this year to do. And if uh, there is not a clear US statement on record that uh, uh, this would be absolutely uh, intolerable. The positive part of the agenda is energy security. And I think that there are essentially two big issues that could and should be accomplished. One is uh, the huge Stockman uh, gas field in the Arctic Sea uh, that could and should uh, produce LNG for delivery to the US. This would be a big positive connection between Russia and the US. 
and the other is access to the Russian gas pipeline system for Europe. Probably that could not be agreed uh, directly, but a big step in that direction could be made. That's uh, primarily for the uh, Europeans. So altogether, this is not much. And if you can't accomplish much anyhow, why not at least make sure that you stand up and uh, make a truthful statement, in particular when you have such statements that you should uh, eat up uh, from uh, before. Uh, more broadly, what should the West do uh, with uh, Russia? I very much agree with uh, Karl Gershman's line here. We should work for integration. Russia is now very close to conclude a bilateral accession agreement to the WTO uh, uh, with the US. Uh, virtually nothing remains. I think that this will be concluded by the summit, and I think that this is something that we should welcome. The integration of Russia economically strengthens the liberal forces uh, in Russia. For the same reason, I would be in favor of LNG deliveries uh, from Russia uh, to the, uh, the US. But what should we do about these corrupt people at the top in the Kremlin? Well, we have one good example of what can be done. The private Alpha Group, for its own commercial reasons, is pursuing Minister of Communications Leonid Reiman, a close friend of uh, uh, Putin's from St. Petersburg. And uh, what they have revealed in courts is that Raymond has uh, benefited in the order of $1 billion in telecommunication assets while being Minister of Telecommunications. And this a private Russian group has done. No Western government has bothered to deal with this. And you wonder then, as uh, Andre mentions uh, in his book, the purchase by uh, Gazprom of uh, uh, Sibneft for $13 billion. And uh, we don't know uh, how much kickback there was. The general assumption is that there was something between $1 and $11 billion. We don't know. But uh, you would expect some Western government to investigate this, given that the transaction has been taking place. Uh, in, in the West. So this is something that I can't quite understand, that uh, the Western governments are not going after uh, what is obviously uh, just about the largest uh, uh, money laundering cases that we could see in the world, uh, in all probability undertaken by top Russian uh, officials who barely hide their uh, business activities at the same time as this could decide which way Russia goes for the future. Thank you. And thank you. Our last speaker will be David Sayatasadar, who is currently a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. He has covered Soviet and Russia affairs as a correspondent for both the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal. He has written numerous articles and two books about Russia. The first, The Age of Delirium, The Decline and Fall of the Soviet Union, is currently being made into a documentary film. And the second is Darkness at Dawn, The Rise of, of the Russian Criminal. David. Rise of the Russian Criminal State. 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 Russian criminals existed, uh, uh, <laughs> have existed for a long time, unfortunately. Uh, I've had the, uh, uh, the honor to be the editor of uh, Andre's book. I've known Andre for a long time, and uh, we're also good, uh, good friends. And I've read many of his articles in the Russian press over the years. Working on the book, uh, I was able to uh, understand really the philosophy and the the worldview that underpins his. Uh, his journalistic writing. And what it confirmed for me is something that's uh, of which we're oftentimes not fully aware, and that is the existence of a liberal and uh, humane political tradition in Russia, 
which is capable of guiding the country's destinies despite all the talk about Russian peculiarity, Russia's special way, the Russian approach to democracy, the fact that Russians don't understand democracy is in the way that what the West understands it. What the book demonstrates is that there are Russians who understand d democracy perfectly well, no less well than people in this country or any other Western country, and that they are absolutely capable of seeing in the clearest terms what is happening in Russia and the degradation to which the country is being led by its aspiration to authoritarianism. I've always felt on the basis of my observations in Russia that the real problem in Russia, the kind of Ariadne's thread which is essential for understanding Russia and, and, uh, and according and which really relates to everything else is the imbalance in the country between the power of the state and the dignity of the individual. It's clear, and all democracy presupposes it, that without respect for the inalienable rights of the individual and his inherent dignity, it's impossible to exercise real control over the government apparatus. And the whole of Russian history, beginning with the Tsarist period, reaching uh, absolutely inhuman extremes under the communist period and today in the post-communist era demonstrates the consequences of an uncontrolled government machine which regards the, the citizens of, the, of, of, of Russia not as human beings in their own right, not as ends in themselves, which is essential to the Western tradition, but rather as means to an end. The consequence of all this, in my view, is that Russia under the pressure of this hypertrophied state apparatus has a very questionable and tenuous understanding of ethical transcendence. The idea that rules apply equally to all, that there are rules that are over and above the realm of society, over and above the interests of individual human beings, and over and above the interests of the state, and that the state, no less than the individual, is obliged to conduct itself in accordance with those rules. What we see now as the authoritarianism of the Yeltsin era is now, has now reached its logical expression in the authoritarianism of the Putin era is the attempt really to hold the state up as itself a source of values. Not, rather, than some, rather than as an entity which is in need of moral guidance. And this expresses itself, I think, in, in various ways, all of which are, are very dangerous, not only for Russians, um, but for the rest of the world as well. It's clear that, the, that the, the upshot of the development of authoritarianism, uh, the perfection of authoritarianism under Putin, is to eliminate once and for all the possibility that the Russian people will ever choose their own rulers. If you look at all of the things that have happened, the Kharkovsky case, the control of the media, the, the, the new law on NGOs, the, the direct appointment of governors, which may be followed by the direct appointment of mayors, what you see is a situation in which those who hold power now are preparing the groundwork for a system which will allow them to keep power no matter what the will of the population. That doesn't mean necessarily that Putin will continue in office, although he could, and I think that question has not been resolved. What it means is that a system is in place which will make it possible for those who, who, who as, aspire to rob the, the population and to hang on to their uh, ill-gotten wealth will never be challenged, and the many questions which exist, and many of them were raised in Andrei's book about how exactly Putin got to be president of Russia will never be answered. The Putin regime has every reason to fear going into opposition. Uh, I, <clears throat> the terrorist acts which have taken place in Russia in many cases are unexplained, beginning with the 1999 apartment buildings and continuing with the, with the uh, terrorist outrages in the Nordost uh, performance in the theater in Dubrovka and in Beslan. The uh, situation in which those who, the, uh, the oligarchs and those who hold, ma you know, l 
who 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 are who are, are extremely wealthy in Russia are in fear of contributing to any other political force except that force which which supports the the present oligarchy and in which uh, all television is in effect in the hands of the regime not to mention the government apparatus more or less assures or appears to assure that it, that there are insuperable obstacles to replacing Putin and raising fundamental issues about the way in which the country is governed and the way in which uh, uh, the wealth of the country is being uh, disposed of. Beyond that, uh, we see in Russia's foreign policy the absence of a sense of genuine ethics and genuine moral behavior. Russia is a natural geopolitical ally of the United States. And the reason for this is simple. We have the same enemies. Russia and uh, the United States are both interested in balancing the growing power of China and certainly are threatened by demented Islamic extremism. Under these circumstances, Russia has every interest in being a part of the West and can coordinating its foreign policy with the foreign policy of the West. Instead, what does it do? It supplies anti-aircraft missiles to Iran, encourages the Iranian nuclear weapons program, provides advanced mi military technology to China, and attempts to discourage the development of democracy in countries like Ukraine, which can only infect, uh, uh, the, the development of which can only work to the benefit of the world and to, and to Russia itself. R the attitude of the Russians toward a people's right to decide, its own, decide on its own government was demonstrated in the Ukrainian elections when in the face of massive vote, vote fraud, uh, Yeltsin hurried not once but twice to congratulate Yanukovych on his quote unquote convincing victory. <coughs> but more than this, and uh, uh, reflecting the other two factors, is the fact that Russia uh, is and the present Russian leadership in defiance of all common, <coughs> common sense and uh, all intellectual integrity is trying to develop some type of new <coughs> authoritarian ideology. It has been the misfortune of Russia to assume that there was some special Russian way to improve on the universal moral values of civilization. There, of course, is no such way. There is no way to improve upon them. They've they, it is those values which come down to us from the Bible through the Judaic Christian tradition are the only way of regulating human behavior in a, in, a, in a moral fashion. And no talk about a special Russian way, the special prerogatives of the Russian state, the supposed uh, 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 which it masked by claims for superior spirituality uh, uh, is going to be an improvement over the simple precepts of right and wrong that govern the behavior of all truly democratic governments. And yet, uh, hi, beginning with uh, high uh, officials of the Russian Orthodox Church, recently Metropolitan Kirill, and followed by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, leading Russian, uh, Russian political, literary, and intellectual figures, have suggested that human rights are not universally applicable, that what matters is obligations. Well, who is to impose these obligations? This is not, this is not uh, uh, when in fact, you, the, the very notion of rights indicates the defense of the individual, the individual against his government. Under these circumstances, Russia, gives every appearance of once more descending into the kind of delirium that has engulfed it in the past and led to nothing good in its political and uh, uh, economic life. Con Russia is a country dotted with mass graves, by the way, many of which have not been acknowledged, <coughs> graves left over from the Stalin era which no one any longer bothers to, to, to unearth, uh, investigate, or even mark. Uh, and with this buried heritage, to begin to, to, to circulate such uh, justification, justifications for authoritarianism 
in the context of a society which is in effect dying because of its loss of population and loss of hope uh, is really to show that all of our hopes for democracy in Russia and the spiritual transformation of the country are to some extent in vain. And against that background, it is extremely encouraging to read a book like the book that Andre has produced, which although it consists of, of short articles, also exists as a political and even artistic whole, because it, unlike so many other collections of articles, there's a consistent point of view, there's a, an understanding of underlying values, and there's an indication of the way in which Russia needs to go if it's to save itself and to avoid the false ideas and the false values that have, have so ruined the, and de the, the, the political life of the country in the past. Under these circumstances, um, you know, it was a great, great honor for me to work, to work on the book with uh, Andre, and I uh, very much hope that people in the American government who've been s oftentimes very superficial in their attitude toward Russia will take the time to read this book, especially on the eve of the G8 meeting, which presents a great opportunity for us, once again, since we've made the mistake of giving Russia status it doesn't deserve, of reaffirming for Russia what we mean by universal values and the importance of democracy. Thank you very much, David. Andre, do you want to take a minute or two and just respond to the panel's comments? Well, maybe wait. Uh, we get some, we, some do you want to do, okay, you want to get questions some questions? From the okay. Um, we'll now move to questions and answers. Uh, please wait for the mic to come and then identify yourself. Also, indicate which panelists, to which panelists you are addressing your question. And also speak slowly and clearly, since we have a lot of foreign media broadcasts in this regard. And in that sense, I'd like to ask the media to, po to allow, allow the media to pose their questions first, since you have uh, deadlines. Which, uh, any media questions? Seeing none, we will then proceed to general questions. Uh, do you want to give it to the gentleman? Just uh, the black track. Uh, Chris Schaefer, I was wondering if you could say, this is really to anyone who, who wants to answer the question, sorry, if, if um, or maybe even Andre, can you talk a little bit about uh, Putin's popularity in the country? Um, and you, we've sort of outlined uh, concerns about um, the, the, the trends in the country, but is he popular with the Russian people, that sort of thing? Uh, yes, sir. According, uh, according to opinion poll, uh, Putin, uh, if election uh, uh, were today, he would uh, get, well, either slightly more than 50 percent or slightly less uh, than 50 percent, and uh, certainly um, will be re-elected. Uh, this attitude is uh, a combination of two reasons. Uh, first, uh, very favorable comparison uh, uh, with Yeltsin people in the eyes of uh, uh, population, which uh, regularly did not get uh, their salary and pensions uh, during Yeltsin period. And now, uh, because of this um, oil prices, uh, uh, state have enough money, enough money uh, to um, fulfill its. Um, uh, immediate uh, immediate obligation. Uh, the second reason it's uh, complete dominance uh, of uh, state TV with only one uh, one uh, political figure, and uh, uh, people simply uh, don't uh, know any any other uh, other uh, other alternatives. Uh, but I would say that uh, this is not um, uh, why uh, I'm almost skeptical about uh, opinion polls, because opinion polls lack a very important parameter, intensity of, of your support. Well, a person uh, uh, comes to the street and asking, are you for the Putin or the Primakov? You are answering yes uh, or no. Uh, let me remind you that uh, 
Mr. Primakov, who was crushed by this uh, success operation uh, designed by Berezovsky and uh, executed uh, by Putin election campaign, was a very popular figure um, in the summer of 1990. The same, even, even higher figures, uh, 75 uh, percent. Well, uh, Yeltsin unceremoniously threw him out uh, from his post uh, seat of the prime minister. And what happened? Where were these uh, 75 uh, percent uh, who were supporting uh, Mr. Primakov? They did not uh, get to the street uh, scanning Primakov, Primakov. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, a case uh, uh, not of enthusiastic, passionate support, it's a case uh, of, uh, of lack of choice and, uh, and um, a lack of uh, other, other opportunities. Um, let me expand a bit. Uh, um, answering your question about uh, uh, perspectives of, uh, of, uh, of this regime. It's not threatened uh, by any democratic uh, revolution. Uh, uh, there were some uh, um, fears in Kremlin immediately after Ukrainian elections that Orange Revolution instigated by uh, foreigners uh, will happen tomorrow, and the Kremlin propaganda is crying that uh, frontline uh, is going through every street, uh, every house, and so on. Well, now they come down and uh, uh, realize that uh, the nothing certain, and there will be not uh, there will be no opportunity to change this regime uh, by democratic election because there will be no democratic election. But uh, this kind of regime has an internal, uh, internal problem, internal weakness, the problem of transition. And now, it's, when it's passed uh, through the transition period, the inevitable, the uh, divisions inside the ruling group, uh, uh, it's inevitable. And we're already uh, watching the first sign with this uh, mysterious second of uh, general prosecutor, which certainly was a result of uh, fierce fighting of two uh, competing, uh, uh, competing clans. And uh, if during this uh, uh, internal fighting some other figure uh, will appear, well, uh, I think that uh, in uh, two, three weeks of uh, indoctrination uh, by state uh, uh, owned TV companies, uh, well, uh, this figure will get uh, the same figure, uh, the, the same level of, uh, of support like, uh, like Mr. Putin. The gentleman in the pink shirt, please, Ben. Thank you. I'm Mike Haltzell. I thought it was a terrific presentation, all four of you. Uh, Andre, you, uh, toward the end of your talk, you, you said that the uh, murder of the Russian diplomat and the three other embassy employees in Baghdad was evidence that uh, we have common interests, Russia and the United States, against Islamofascism. And whatever one thinks of the wisdom of the Iraq war, I think that's indisputably true. Unfortunately, the preponderant media reaction in Russia was rather vituperative anti-Americanism, not attacking the people who did the murdering. And uh, we even got a, an insight, further insight in the list when somebody left the microphone inadvertently on at the G8 ministerial and we heard Sergei Lavrov yes, I heard this. in a duel with the Condoleezza Rice over this. My question is, um, has the virtual monopoly by the government of the electronic media in Russia uh, managed to change public opinion about the danger of this Islamofascism, or is this just the establishment talking? Um, I think if haven't managed, uh, if haven't changed the perception of Russian people uh, about uh, Islam a fascist uh, danger, but certainly it has changed uh, perception of Russian people about United States. Uh, well, it was usual phenomena um, during class uh, ten. Yes, that well, uh, the basic level of uh, anti-American uh, feeling was about 20 percent. 20 percent usually regard America as a threat to Russia. It's quite natural after, after history of the Cold War. 
Uh, then, um, time from time, uh, TV launch uh, some hysterical anti-American uh, campaign, sometimes on serious reason, for example, war in Yugoslavia, uh, sometimes on uh, just preposterous, for example, humiliation of Russian sportsmen during Salt Lake uh, Olympic Games. And uh, after this campaign uh, uh, continued for a couple of weeks, uh, well, this uh, figure jumped to 45, for example. But campaign ended, everybody forget about Milosevic or Russian sportsmen, presumed humiliation and so on. You see, it's returned to basic figure uh, to 20%. From this famous uh, uh, Putin statement after Beslan, which I, I quote, this propaganda is going on for two years, uh, for 24 hours. And uh, now the results, well, I looked through figures uh, just yesterday. And what is very funny, well, certainly uh, I was not surprised that, uh, well, I was surprised that figure is um, uh, comparatively modest. About 43% of population uh, regard uh, uh, America. So this uh, 43, which they managed to keep for two weeks, now they, they keep uh, permanently. But what's absolutely funny, it's uh, the list of the countries, uh, five countries are perceived by most dangerous enemies of Russia with the rating about Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, United States of America, and Georgia. But it, it speaks a lot. Such combination uh, speaks a lot. It means that uh, after this TV uh, indoctrination, uh, people have a very schizophrenic, uh, a very schizophrenic uh, uh, view on the world. And you're absolutely right about this. Uh, this reaction uh, to the tragedy of our uh, diplomat was. Uh, was in, just indecent, both uh, on uh, official level. On official level, they make the statement that certainly the United States uh, keeps our responsibility. Well, maybe in the same sen sense, like Putin personally keeps responsibility for death of 300 Russian children in in in, in, in this one. But uh, uh, talking um, uh, um, talking heads uh, on uh, state TV. Even indoctrinating uh, implicitly, sometimes very explicitly, the idea that, well, our Muslim friends couldn't do it. Certainly, it's an uh, operation uh, uh, organized and, uh, by CIA and uh, uh, something uh, like this. Well, on the day after beheading uh, his diplomats, Putin addressed uh, all uh, foreign, uh, foreign ministers notable. Well, these three ideas, that we should change our relations with America, certainly in, uh, you understand in what direction. Second, that we can't join any, uh, as he put it, uh, sacred uh, alliance. Uh, it's uh, just uh, um, repeating the fa famous Lavrov formula that, well, Russia is not taking side in, in this conflict unleashed by, well, maybe Iraq war. Uh, instigated by the United States. And the third, uh, that, uh, uh, well, in non-proliferation uh, agenda, we are uh, decisively against any, any, any ultimatums. If the statements make mockery of so-called uh, joint uh, uh, six-power statements uh, on Iran. Moreover, during his uh, um, very friendly meetings uh, uh, in Shanghai with uh, a person who uh, once a week uh, calls for wiping uh, Israel out uh, of the map. Uh, Putin mentioned uh, uh, first that uh, the Iran should have some uh, facility for scientific um, enrichment uh, of uranium. And talking with, uh, with uh, uh, Russian correspondents, mentioned that, well, our Muslim friends are making a lot for freeing uh, our diplomats. The role of Iran in this, uh, in this tragedy was sinister, because uh, uh, Iran doesn't conceal uh, its connection with, uh, with the group in this so-called Mujahideen Shura. And moreover, during this crisis, uh, Iran makes several times statements that, well, we can be helpful if Russia asks us nicely. So it was a kind of blackmailing of Russia. 
and Putin so sensitive to any encroachment of on on uh, pride and honor of Russian states, uh, well, he calls us to such uh, to such behavior. It's very strange. It's it's not explained by any reason of state security. It's explained by complexes uh, of Russian political elite. and and unfortunately, Putin. Uh, I, I describe Putin in one in one of my say as the most outstanding mediocrity of our political class. Paraphrasing the famous uh, uh, Trotsky formula um, uh, about uh, Stalin, and as a mediocrity of uh, our political class, certainly he shares all these complexes and frustration. But as outstanding mediocrity, in the uh, September 2002, he, he took a very wise. Uh, decision and now what what it's doing now is just contrary to his philosophy uh, of uh, uh, that period. So this uh, frustration and complexes prevail, I am afraid, irrevocably in Putin's mind in and Putin's soul over the consideration uh, of uh, stage reason and uh, and national security. Would any of the other panelists like to add any comments to the last two questions? Okay, uh, the. Uh, person in the back in the, uh, the shirt. Uh, my name is Brian Eisenhower. I'm the intern uh, here at Hudson. Um, on page six of uh, Andre's new book, he writes, enough of Putin. Ultimately, he is a replaceable figure. If there was no Putin, there would be a Putin. What matters is Putinism, a toolkit to enable the authorities to keep themselves in power. Um, so my question is, who makes up the vast and powerful group of authorities um, who you're writing about here? Um, are they holdovers from the old Soviet Union? Are they simply rich people who are part of the oligarchy of crony capitalists who dominate Russia's economy? Uh, who are these people? Well, uh, let me look at the page six. <laughs> at that time, at that time, certainly it was uh, a crony capitalist uh, around the Yeltsin family. Uh, I briefly uh, touched this issue. They appointed uh, Putin was not elected. Election was uh, a campaign, a, a exercise of uh, uh, TV um, public relations. Uh, first, he was appointed uh, uh, personally. Berezovsky, uh, Valoshin, um, head of uh, Yeltsin administration. Yeltsin daughter Tatiana, uh, her boyfriend Yumashev. This. Uh, Actually, four or five people. Maybe Abramovich also was part uh, uh, of this uh, uh, of this group. They appointed Putin to be. Uh, no old uh, Soviet uh, people from '67. Now, uh, the problem of uh, so-called successor is decided uh, by a new business group, by a new business group which includes Putin himself, of course. And uh, his uh, closest uh, uh, KGB associates, but it's not former top Soviet KGB. It was uh, very middle-rank uh, people who served with him in Dresden or in Saint Petersburg, uh, uh, Sechin, uh, uh, Yakunin, uh, this uh, uh, other people, and. Uh, well, they have not. Uh, David was right. They have not yet decided what was the mechanism. Uh, I, looking uh, into Putin's soul uh, for a very long time, and I think I understand him a bit. Uh, well, uh, I think he, he personally, he is not very eager to, to, to run for third, uh, for third term. Uh, he already is a very wealthy person, and uh, he may, uh, may enjoy the rest of uh, uh, his life somewhere in French Alps or uh, something like this. Uh, but uh, people around, many people around here don't see any, any future uh, without Putin. Because in Russia, losing power is losing wealth. The 10, 15 people who rule Russia now, the, the current Politburo, these same people owe Russia. They owe all the main oil and gas uh, as such uh, of the country. And for them, it's a uh, very important issue uh, who will be uh, the next president. And uh, I already noted that uh, it's quite probable that there were very serious division during this, uh, uh, this transition uh, period. One more point provoked by your questions, but rather 
uh, referring to previous uh, question on, on Russian foreign policy. There is a new factor in Russian foreign policy. Uh, well, look at these uh, 15 people who rules Russia and who owes Russia. A lot of in their life, stability of regime, their political power, their world uh, prestige, and their personal wealth, after all, depends on one figure, number of dollars for barrel of oil. And they remember very well uh, the collapse of Soviet Union after the oil prices uh, collapsed in the uh, middle of 80s. And believe me, these people will not be passive observers of volatility of oil prices in the world. They have a lot of political, as a leaders uh, of very important power, they have a lot of member, permanent member of Security Council, super nuclear power, super energy power, they have a lot of leverage uh, uh, well, to influence on this, uh, this figure. And I think uh, a lot of, uh, uh, in Russian policy around Iran, is uh, exp Moscow policy around Iran, explained now by their desire to keep uh, uh, oil prices as high um, as possible. Uh, not only me, but any Russian, any Russian speaker uh, in Washington, uh, even if he represents the government, they always ask one, one question. Why Russia is so reckless, uh, so light-minded about uh, um, prospect of Iran acquiring uh, nuclear weapon? Nuclear weapon. Well, it's because, by the way, don't forget that Iran is the only state which officially has territorial claims uh, uh, to Russian Federation. I mean the, the Caspian, uh, in to Azerbaijan, by the way, Caspian, uh, Caspian Sea surface. And by demographic projection, uh, in 2040, there will be 1 million Russian and one, uh, 100 million Russian and 105 million Iranian. And the answer is very simple. Because uh, people in Moscow are, well, you may say anything about it, them, but they are not stupid. They know very perfectly well that Iran will never have a nuclear bomb, that either the United States or Israel will deal uh, with, this, uh, with this problem. And uh, um, practically, uh, the latest Putin statement, we are against any ultimatum in non-proliferation. It means that uh, uh, Moscow will not allow Security Council never to take uh, any real sanction uh, against, uh, against Iran. It means that the Iranian regime will have no incentive to stop a nuclear problem. It means that uh, sooner or later, rather sooner, Israel will make its uh, preventive uh, strike. It, it's the best case uh, a scenario for this 10-15 uh, people in Moscow. First, well, a serious uh, uh, Iran nuclear problem will be solved. Second, uh, all the fury of uh, Islamic world will be channeled certainly against Israel and the United States. And the third, and most important, can you imagine a crisis about this action? Because Iran doesn't conceal that as a territory, um, a territory step. It certainly block, uh, uh, hit uh, uh, Saudi platform and Armenian Straits and block, block any oil uh, exports uh, uh, from Middle East. Well, 200, 400 dollars per barrel, maybe. Okay. We have a question from the media, actually. Just looking to uh, identify, identify yourself, please. Uh, Radio Free Asia, Gregory Ho. Um, uh, the question is a little bit out of the topic of today, but if, if you don't mind to look into the mind of Putin, uh, how about for the North Korean, they, they're testing the missile. Uh, would it this, would uh, Putin be more happy there to see the North Korean testing missile, or what are the response from the, from the, uh, the, the Russian side? Uh, since we have not much information we need uh, nowadays from from the Russian side. What actually Putin would do if you look into the mind of himself? Thank you. Uh, very, very interesting question. Thank you. Because it reminds me, um, it reminds me of this, this story of Putin and uh, North Korea missiles. It is an interesting story. Uh, do you remember 
in 2000, yes, in 2000, uh, there was summit in Okinawa, uh, G8 summit in Okinawa. It's the first uh, uh, Putin G8 summer. On the way to uh, Okinawa, Putin visited North Korea, and uh, he came to Okinawa and, uh, well, very enthusiastically declared that I, I brought a decision of the problem. And Mr. Kim chen promised uh, me that there will be no missile development, no test, uh, no missile development. Well, yesterday's event is a very, very good uh, illustration. Well, and uh, in two weeks, uh, uh, Kim chen uh, Kim chen thought, well, it was a joke, a joke with Mr. Putin. It's very interesting that Mr. Putin is uh, uh, obsessed uh, or rather, not Putin. I, I talk. It, it's uh, uh, it's um, obsession of Russian political class uh, generally. Obsessed with this, uh, so obsessed with this an animosity to the West and the United States it allows uh, such gentlemen come, came Chenier, uh, Akhmedijan, and others uh, just make make fun of them. Uh, answering directly to your question, uh, what Mr. Putin can do, nothing. Uh, nothing is in the case of uh, uh, of uh, uh, Iran. Uh, Putin has some leverage and uh, and uh, use them rather skillfully. For example, we have no time to talk in details uh, about supply of Russian anti-aircraft missiles uh, um, TM1 to Iran, which makes this Israeli strikes uh, more and more. Uh, probable, but uh, in North Korea, uh, Moscow has uh, uh, no leverage at all. China has some uh, serious uh, leverage in North Korea, but not not Russia. Okay. In the interest of uh, length of time, I'd like to let everybody ask their question, and then the panelists can respond to those uh, points which most interest them. So why don't we proceed, uh, starting in the back, moving towards the front. Um, so go ahead and please identify yourself and then ask your question. Uh, my name is Michael McLaughlin. I'm with uh, United Press International. And there was kind of una unanimity among the panelists that uh, Russia and the U.S. have an interest in fighting um, Islamic terrorism together. But is it possible that the United States really has an interest in seeing Russia weakened by Islamic terrorism and that will make it easier for them to support democracy in Ukraine or Georgia or uh, acquire energy security in Europe? With some of them. Uh, give, yeah. give me a pause. No, that's what I'm going to do. My name is Valentin Zelenyuk. I'm a senior economist at the Kiev Economics Institute and a professor at ERC, Kiev, uh, here at Kennedy Institute, who's a fellow right now. And I have a question uh, to everybody, and especially to the specialist in the soul of Putin. What, do you th what is your opinion on the uh, attitude of soul of Putin uh, towards Ukraine, uh, especially to uh, foreign and economic policy, to uh, gas issues and also territorial issues, Crimea and Tuzla Island. Thank you. Barry Wood, Voice of America. I think uh, particularly to Mr. Satter, but anyone else, you've suggested that uh, Russia doesn't belong in the G8. Well, it's in, as we all know. What does that mean for the process to have a authoritarian, increasingly authoritarian state in? Does that suggest that we should go further and widen the club, or should the club be disbanded, or what are your thoughts on this? Ron McNamara with the Helsinki Commission. Uh, there were a couple of uh, references to quotes by President Bush, but I wonder if you could address the question of Vice President Cheney's thinking on Russia in the, in the lead up now to the G8 summit. Um, Austin Benonis with Radio, for your Radio Liberty. Um, Andre, would you be willing to name some of the political technologists that you may have identified in your book? And then a question to everyone, which is these, uh, this concept of somehow Russia being unique and having a unique path to development is mirrored or surfaces in all of the former Soviet space. 
Now, is this, uh, and it undermines democracy in all of the former Soviet states as well. So I'd like a comment from others. Angela Stent from Georgetown University. Andre, you describe very eloquently how Russia has got to where it is now and what Putinism is, but we know that it won't remain like that forever. What are the sources of change? How is this particular system going to unravel? Because even if the people at the top want to stay in power or keep the system forever, they can't. So what, what causes change? Are there any more questions? OK, we have one more one up here, please. Ludmila Foster, I have a, a bona fide question to all four uh, panelists, and anybody can answer. Um, we in the Congress of Russian Americans absolutely cannot figure out what was there first, the chicken or the egg. Implicit in all of your talks was the, the um, accusations and the animosity between American media, American administration, American intellectuals, and Russian media uh, in Russia, uh, Russian government representatives. And so who, was, who started it? Who was there first? I'd like to go in reverse order of the presentations, beginning with David, please. Do you have any? Uh, well, uh, starting with the question that was uh, addressed specifically to me, I don't think that Russia should continue to be a member of the G8 if it, if it evolves in an authoritarian direction. At the same time, uh, the fact that it is a member uh, and will not be easily removed from the organization does give the other members of the G8 an opportunity to exert influence on Russia. By speaking frankly to Russia and, and, and threatening them literally with expulsion from the organization and exclusion in various forms, it's possible to limit to a certain extent the authoritarian evolution of the country. We don't want the situation in Russia to become even worse. And although Russians hate uh, the, the criticism that they often get from the West about human rights abuses and similar things, the fact is that they do listen to it because they understand that it's legitimate, however much they may pretend uh, to the contrary. Regarding some of the uh, other issues that were raised, I think that the West has no interest in using Islamic terrorism or anything else in order to weaken Russia. A weakened Russia is a danger to the West, no less than a danger to its own people. What is weakening Russia right now is its own authoritarian evolution. As a result of the increasing uh, uh, tendency toward dictatorship in Russia, corruption is increasing exponentially. The country is becoming more brutal and uh, as a result is creating enemies for itself that it doesn't need. And the, 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 the flames, so to speak, of Islamic extremism are being stoked even more. Chechnya, although it often isn't mentioned in the Western press in this context, is really the second uh, justification for Islamic extremism after the Arab-Israeli situation. Uh, and with, uh, with, I think, a considerably more justice, actually. And many of the people who have surfaced as suicide bombers or Islamic terrorists at one time or another wanted to go to Chechnya to fight the Russians, as they saw it. The, we don't, you know, there's an information blockade there. We don't know a lot about what's happening, but information does reach the Arab world about the atrocities that have been committed. And as far as using Islamic extremism, the recent terrorist acts and the many, many questions which surround those terrorist acts in Russia itself raise, can much more legitimately raise the question of who is trying to use uh, uh, Islamic extremism and for what purpose? Okay, Andrews, yeah. do you want to Yeah, yeah, I mean. Thank you. Three uh, uh, quick responses to three questions. Uh, Rob McNamara's Cheney's thinking, good. Uh, the problem with Cheney's speech was uh, that there was neither leader nor follow-up, so it lacks credibility. It's uh, just as in order to put out uh, uh, 
uh, uh, sort of cloud of now spe speaking and uh, anybody afterwards can conclude this is not uh, President Bush's uh, thinking. Second uh, point, uh, Barry Wood, uh, yes, broaden G8. Uh, if uh, G8 is not a club of industrial democracies, uh, make it broader so that it becomes more representative. The uh, eighth biggest economy in the world is not Russia but China. Russia is the tenth the economy, so it's almost up there. Add India, Brazil and South Africa, and then you have a very representative group and uh, focus on economic issues. Uh, G7 exists for the ministers of finance and governors of central banks. Uh, uh, keep it broaden G8 to G12. Uh, Valentin uh, Zelenyuk's questions about uh, Ukraine. I think generally the conclusion in Moscow was uh, in the Kremlin was that um, Russia was too soft and therefore it should be tougher. Uh, and uh, with regard to gas, I really don't think that it's uh, a po uh, <laughs> primarily political issues. What we are seeing is now that. Uh, uh, a market price between 120 and 150 dollars per 1,000 uh, cubic meters is uh, spreading throughout uh, uh, the CIS regions, which and 150 dollars is the net back price from euro. So here, I think, on the contrary, that Gazprom <coughs> is caring very strongly about its market capitalization. Enough people in high positions in Moscow do earn substantial amounts of stocks in Gazprom. So here we are actually seeing that the market uh, is taking over. Another impetus in this direction is that Gazprom is not increasing its production. Therefore, it needs to ration uh, with regard to the increasing uh, demand uh, with uh, prices, which I basically think is a good thing. Then it's a question exactly how you time it and how you comply with uh, uh, legal commitments already undertaken. Thank you. Thank you. Carl? Uh, on the uh, question about the political technologists, just, I mean, uh, Andre talks about it in the book. Take a look at page 78 where he, where he describes uh, Gleb Pavlovsky as a character out of the possessed. Uh, <laughs> and I might note also uh, that we have an article in the, in the current issue of the Journal of Democracy on the political technologists. So uh, there's a lot of writing on that. I just want to address the question of who started it. And again, uh, something uh, out of uh, Andre's book. Uh, a book that he refers to repeatedly uh, in his book uh, was, was written uh, over 100 years ago by, by Tolstoy, uh, Haji Murad, describing a situation 50 years before that in 1852. Um, and, you know, this is Chechnya 1852. I mean, it's an old problem. Uh, the problem is that nothing has been done to address it, quite the contrary. It's just gotten dangerously worse since then. Um, but I think, you know, um, uh, you know, I think that addresses the whole issue of what the, the roots of this problem are better than anything else. Uh, let me just also say that Andre, uh, Andre refers repeatedly in the book to Chapter 17, which I urge people to take a look at. But I would also urge take a look at Chapter 15, which is a brilliant chapter on Tsar Nicholas I, uh, which may set a model for some of the uh, leadership qualities you see today. Thank you very much. And Trey, do you have a last comment or you want to make? And then, then Andre will be available afterwards to sign your books and answer questions. Uh, yes, uh, my friends covered uh, almost all um, uh, questions. I um, uh, touch two of them, Ukraine and change, uh, the, the sources, potential sources of change. By the way, uh, these two issues are very strongly interconnected. Uh, well. Ukraine, uh, development in Ukraine certainly presents a very serious threat to Moscow, but not uh, in the sense like uh, Kremlin uh, propaganda describe it, that uh, NATO tanks uh, will move uh, from Kiev to Moscow and so on. The development in Ukraine is a very serious psychological, political uh, threat to Putin's kleptocratic regime or to his corporate state. Because uh, uh, Orange Revolution was a rebellion of uh, Ukrainian uh, people against the same regime uh, uh, of, uh, of Kuchma. And uh, a lot of eyes uh, in uh, Russia now watching what is going in Ukraine. If Ukraine succeeds in uh, 
uh, they declared a new pro-European path of uh, democratic state, transparent uh, uh, economy. It will affect events uh, in Russia enormously, more than anything else. Because we in Russia, for several hundred years, have been debating this eternal issue, whether we're part of Europe or not, whether we're uh, European, Eurasians, uh, and so on. We have some success stories in, in uh, Eastern Europe, Poland, Czechia, in former Soviet Republic, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, but it's not nothing for Russian soul. They are alien. They even bought republics. They were always were alien in the uh, Soviet Union. Ukrainian, they're the part of us. If Ukrainian is the closest uh, people to Russia. 